Uh, I want to welcome everybody to day two of uh, AppSec Cali, uh, certainly the coolest venue, perhaps the coolest uh, AppSec conference I've been to in a very long time. And uh, just a hats off to the organizers. I know these, uh, these things are not easy to put on. I've done a couple myself and uh, a great session. So uh, we'll get going. I've got about 40 minutes. I want to leave some time for questions and answers. Uh, so I'll do the obligatory introduction. Uh, for those that don't know me, I've uh, been in the application security business for a little bit over a decade. I was at the first OWASP AppSec USA back in, I think, 2005. Uh, I spend most of my time, believe it or not, working with CISOs and CSOs who either have half-started AppSec programs or getting it underway. Because uh, I re recognized very early on that as, a, as somebody in this vendor space that does consulting, if our clients are not successful, obviously we're not going to be successful either. Uh, I've been in the security business for 20 plus years, used to be in the U.S. Air Force and learned uh, uh, in incident response and network defense in what used to be called the Air Force CERT in the mid-90s. Mostly what I do now is on the business side, and a lot of speaking and writing. And one of the cool things I'm working with guys like Greg Reber at Aztec, uh, the Aspect folks, Veracode and others, have most recently been working on what's called the Open SAM Benchmarking Initiative, and that's to put data into Open SAM. Uh, so that has been a focus of mine really for the last year and a half uh, to make that a more viable thing. But I will just tell you, the, the bulk of my energy has been in helping organizations essentially justify the business need for AppSec. And I'll talk a little bit about that for a second. So I've been in the business for a very long time, just to get, get things started. Uh, I, that was my first engagement, uh, AppSec circa 1972 uh, at uh, Onyante Elementary School. Actually, that was my first day of school. My mom just sent me that picture. And, and for those who can see in the back, that's a Pinocchio lunchbox. So uh, if you just notice the focus there, bring that on day, day one to work. Uh, apparently, uh, yeah, I was focused slash mad in first grade. But uh, anyhow, that has been my, uh, my effort, not so much in, in AppSec, but in focus in general. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the problem that we have in AppSec. I'll talk about the challenges that we've got and then talk about what this presentation is and what it isn't. The real problem that we have, and I think other speakers, uh, Jeremiah right before this and others have, have really nailed this. What we do is essentially still viewed as discretionary within many organizations. What I mean by that is a nice to do and not a have to do activity outside the largest financials, largest banks, largest uh, retail folks that get it, uh, outside of those companies that had the near death or actual breach experiences, everybody else still has some level of, of discretionary, particularly around AppSec. And I am focusing a lot of my energy right now in writing around what I call breach fixation, where there's this almost inordinate amount of time spent around you know, APT breaches, uh, you know, the, the, the attack side, threat intelligence, at the expense of basic bla blocking and tackling, and AppSec is kind of that blocking and tackling activity. So the challenge that we have is that a lot of organizations will still publish software, will put out new builds, and they can do so without getting their teeth kicked in initially. Ultimately, they're going to have that problem, but there's nobody that's going to force them gun in hand at, at, to do a, a last minute test. So we'll talk about that and the challenges that are recognized. And the other one that what I would focus on big time is the fact that there's this huge incumbent spin, and that's a term that I like to use. Uh, uh, for those that don't know, the number that Gartner uses, it's not the ground truth, but it is a, probably a number, is about a billion dollars, 900 million a year in AppSec scanning. Uh, that includes WAFs. That includes everything around what we do, about a billion a year. You say, well, that's a lot of money in the spend. Uh, endpoint security, um, seven billion, I think it is. Uh, you look at the IDS SEM market, another nine or 10 billion. Uh, AV, I mean, AV hasn't gone away, even though uh, it's much in discredit. Uh, so the challenge that we have is we still, you know, 10 years into AppSec, are going in and trying to get resources in many organizations on top of the incumbent spend that's already been allocated. There's already a constituency, and woe be the person that says, ah, yeah, let's, let's, let's take out antivirus in exchange for the new application security protections, if that makes sense. So that's another challenge that most, at least at the leadership level in the CIO and CISO organization, 
you have this really uh, uh, lack of discretionary spend, kind of like the U.S. national deficit. You know, so much of it's already allocated. You really have a small fraction of discretion. So that's our starting point for a challenge. And what that means is uh, you might have the, the orthodoxy of AppSec down. You may know exactly what you want to do from a programmatic standpoint. You may have the right tools, the right team, the right practices. And, but if you're getting a small amount of resources at the expense of others, you're simply not going to be successful. And that's the problem that I see over and over again, particularly in the lower enterprise, what we call the upper mid-market world is everybody that's not in the top 80 financial companies, if you get this, everybody else, all the rest of the guys. We're based in Texas, so I say everybody in the flyover states, that's us. Uh, if you're talking to specifically the oil and gas industry, you know, they, they, this, this is nice to do stuff for them, AppSec, you know, versus the Wall Street guys who, who kind of get this, if that makes sense. So that is our challenge, is that we've got this incumbent spin going, we've got a, a, a really, 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 uh, at the core of it, a, a function that some view as discretionary. So that's the problem that we have. So the focus of this presentation is going to be really about all the things you do to push a program, to essentially get more resources, to be successful. This is not about SAS versus DAS versus RAS versus IAS. This is not about all the different facets of technical uh, uh, discovery, scanning versus re remediation, all those aspects. Uh, they are well covered in this particular uh, uh, seminar and in week, uh, these two days. What I'm talking about, again, is how do you, if you're that poor guy that's stuck with, with building the program and rolling out the program, uh, what do you do? So uh, what, one of my key thoughts going in before I put this uh, out there was that most AppSec programs, many if not most, will fail before day one. That is the assumption. What I mean is you've not made the business case, you've not convinced folks, you, you, know, you have kind of lukewarm support by the business units, the CIO. Uh, so again, you could have the right tools, team, everything, and you're gonna fail. Because you get a small uh, a bit of resources and go, go, go do your stuff. I, I really don't know what you're doing, I don't understand it. Uh, part of the challenge is in our space too that most of the AppSec function is in the security organization most of the times and most of the people that can fix this stuff are in a totally different organization, the dev or the business units, right? So the risk lives over here. The people that worry about the risk live over here. Here's another truism. Outside of this core group of true believers, if you go to most organizations in the U.S., I would say 90% of AppSec people were deputized, were drafted into that role from a more network security background. So right off the bat, you are at a, uh, a mismatch on a technical and development background. So you see over and over again, you know, you bring vulnerabilities to the, the developers and they'll say, that's not a, uh, not a vulnerability, that's a feature, or uh, that's, a that's, a false, that's not a false positive, that's real. That's, you have a difficult time having that discourse because you can't go blow for blow on the code for them. So part of the key here is that we see over and over uh, application security programs failing before uh, they get on the field. And I, I had a very interesting discussion with a uh, AT&T uh, person recently who said, uh, you know, they're a very regulated market, AT&T, right? They're telecom. They said, the, the quote was, it's not what we do on the field, it's what we do before we get on the field at the regulatory bodies, at the Public Utilities Commission or the, you know, the, the FCC. And I thought that was very interesting. And I think there's a, a, a metaphor here, the thought is, you have to be much more uh, deliberate, a little bit more deep thinking before you start to buy stuff or before you roll out and hire people because most programs fail on the stuff I'm about to talk about and not upon what scanning technology you bought, what vendor you selected. So let's get going. Okay, so I had a five step program. It's five, not 12, not three. Five is the number and the number is five. Uh, because I couldn't come up with six through eight. Uh, but if you have nominations for six through eight, I'm all, uh, all ears. But what this really is, is what I call, to use a software term, artifacts of, of success. Uh, one of the benefits of working in the space for a very, very long time on the vendor side is you get to see a huge portfolio of clients. And you see how they do their, uh, you, you know, roll out these programs. And we've seen it all. We've seen, uh, including teams that, you know, have everything from .NET and Java to BIOS development to, you know, 
that they have just thousands of teams, of, of development teams. <clears throat> what I'm talking about today are what I would consider the artifacts of success that we've seen in each and every one of those to some degree. There's some that jump out at more than others and others that don't, but I can tell you that there's a few that if you don't do this, you will fail. Here's the other assumption going in. Uh, I mean, assume everybody's on an application security team uh, here. You know, team size, typically three to five, five to seven, one to two maybe. Uh, for those that uh, know, we, uh, Denim Group builds a product called ThreadFix, so we have a community version people download, and we ask that question, how many people are on your AppSec team? And the average is three to five across all the big enterprises. That is, so three to five versus thousands of developers. So the other assumption going in here is you simply are never going to be able to, through force and coercion, get the development teams to do on your behalf what they should already be doing. You just don't have strength in numbers, you don't have resources, and absent of the big, uh, uh, you know, the big banks, you probably don't have the ability to do that. So I'll talk about how you want to characterize the landscape. That means before you do anything, what you need a baseline. Again, the, this is the, perhaps the most important step. Uh, what you need to do to secure champions as a, as a conscious effort. You know, this is not in any like SDLC methodology, but it is absolutely the most key step we've seen. Definition of strategy and how you do that, and then executing the initiative and how you do that iteratively and how you adapt, and then finally how you maintain it. These are five key steps uh, that, that I'm gonna jump into really quickly. So the first thing you want to do is characterize the landscape. And I, I'm going to spend probably a disproportionate amount of time on this slide and on these, these concepts. Because again, the, the precept here is one of a little bit more forethought. And you want to be successful and you want to show successes and communicate successes over and over in iterative fashion. So the first thing you want to do is, I'll go through these individually in the interest of time, is you want to know what the compliance frameworks are in the organization. Because as we know, uh, it's easy uh, for development teams and business units to allocate resources when they have to, right? You have a, a buyer who said, I need you to, to check this code. And I just, I just found this out about two weeks ago, apparently in the oil and gas industry, there's a new security standard around SCADA implementations. So, and guess who's pushing those? BP, Exxon, Shell. Guess who's listening in Houston and the rest of the world? Everybody else. Uh, so that is a less of a compliance one, but it's a compliance, a private compliance one, analogous to PCI DSS. So what the point is, is it's not discretionary. If you have to do it, then the business units, I, I, you don't have to convince them. So that's the first thing. And, if, and, and the one thing I would say specifically is, again, think of the portfolio of teams. You're going to have a handful of teams that have to do certain things by compliance or regulation and the rest of the teams don't. So quickly understand where and what, what that compliance coverage is. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Uh, we had a telco uh, client of ours who initiated us to do an open SAM assessment. We're cool, like a one week open SAM assessment for one dev team, huge effort, which was probably over, overkill to be quite candid. We get there and find out they have 35 other dev teams in that environment. Like what about the other 35 dev teams? Oh, well we have to do this for GSA, that's the government and the government's making us do that. What about the other 35 guys? So that, that's important, because you want to get as much coverage as you can uh, from things that make people do stuff. Recognize the gaps at that point. And then also figure out where it influences development practices and how you handle data, how you handle data at rest, how you handle data in transit, all that stuff. Uh, that's a starting point, because you may know the difference between compliance and security, but I bet you the business units don't know, uh, if that makes sense. So that's the first part. First part, knowing that, where to invoke it. The second thing, and I'm a big uh, fan of cultural uh, uh, drivers and congruency around culture. Obviously, Google is different from American Express, is different from Rackspace, is different from uh, BP. And the starting point for understanding uh, how to implement these things is, is, uh, is knowing what those norms are. Uh, again, I, I, I evoke a, a, an example in our backyard uh, there is a very large oil services firm who has safety as their number one key culture norm. Safety. Because in oil and gas, people die if they do dumb things on oil rigs, right? So that's their, cult, their number one uh, driver of, of the culture. So they invoke safety and safety of applications 
throughout the SDLC. It's all, everything goes back to safety, where if you took that back to a bank, safety, would, who cares? I mean, but, uh, but you get my drift, is they, they, they evoke that and, 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 and bring that down as a requirement, but that's true. But also uh, understand that that, that dev in the dev teams could be very, very different, and that there could be cultures that are really tied to the development that those teams are doing. The guys that are doing the dev team for that GSA uh, example I gave you may be very structured, may be kind of more of a waterfall uh, uh, style because of that's what the government wants. But the other team that's doing mobile may be doing one week sprints and be doing agile. So you have to know where you're going, you know, what you're going to do security wise, because that those those are two different, essentially different entities, completely different uh, uh, challenges there. So uh, knowing the norms is imp uh, important, and then related to that is knowing what SDLCs are in place. And I use the term, you know, the plural and not the singular, because in most sophisticated organizations, you're going to see everything under the sun. Every method, every approach, uh, knowing what languages, frameworks, all that's important, but also knowing how they do it and how they build it, so you know where to drop uh, security uh, uh, waypoints in. Uh, so that is uh, knowing the, the SDLCs, knowing uh, what, their, what the drivers are uh, culture-wise, you know, if time to market, if you're Netflix or Etsy and time to market trumps everything, then you have to build a, a scanner for live scanning that captures stuff before, when it's in production. So the other thing I, I noticed on here is you gotta do a little bit of Pareto's principle in the SDLCs. You'll see most stuff is, uh, that's developed out there has some kind of SDLC that you're aware of. Then you'll get into the more arcane, arcane languages, you know, closed systems or BIOS uh, driven stuff. There's still a, a risk and they're still worrisome to the people within the organization, it's hard to apply much of what we do, which is very much, you know, it's OWASP, right? Open web application security project, right? So it's a, the, a lot of the webby stuff that we do is, is you have to do a, a translation layer for the outliers. But don't forget the outliers, because as we've noticed, you'll find a lot of risk in them as well. Uh, identify the artifacts of software security. And what that means there is, is specifically, don't assume they've done nothing, and don't assume they're doing everything. Just do a quick, I think the term in consulting is gap analysis. Uh, figure out the efficacy or the effectiveness of that. Uh, and, but also understand what prompted that buy in the first place. Because you, you may get to understand what's driving their own paranoia. If they bought an application scanner or got one of the uh, SaaS providers or did training two years ago, what was the trigger event? What was the rationale? For doing that, because that'll tell you what drives uh, their perceived uh, risk. Uh, is it uh, ongoing? Did it fail? Was it a one-off? Uh, all those things are important because when you go back, you may have a bigger hurdle with a particular team uh, if you find out that, oh, we tried this two years ago and it blew up in our face and Bill got fired. Okay. When you're looking into 100 teams, one of the things you're going to have to do is figure out where you get the most coverage in the shortest amount of time. Right? You got five people, or 12, or a three against 3,000. So one of the things we recommend is if you do find one of those teams is you pivot off of that and say, look, we know those guys aren't great, but we're going to make more, we're going to have more coverage and more, uh, gain more ground with these other teams because they're receptive and they got the right people in place. Uh, was it impactful? All these things. So, so catalog that. Uh, we, you'd be amazed. I would say most of the clients we work with, the vast majority don't do this. They just start, you know, we're going to go build a house. Let's go to Home Depot and throw stuff in the the back of the car, start building stuff and go, you know, running, running out. Like, th this is very important to be deliberate and find out what's ha already happened or else you'll learn the hard way. You know, you'll spend on stuff that you don't need. Okay, recognize the gap between policy and practice. This is really should be say practice, uh, look at the gap between what they say they're doing and what they're doing. ID those gaps. At this point, you start to need to communicate and socialize both upward and outward, both to the teams what you found uh, if you are uh, a sophisticated organization person, you're going to paint this as negative a picture as possible to some degree. So you can say, this is how I got it, and then this is what were the improvement that we charted. There's, some, there's something there that. True, but you really need to let and quantify the risk for you know, the folks. They don't know. that uh, They simply don't know and don't, they're not getting beat up by this. So don't assume that this stuff is happening. I don't assume that, uh, that what's happening is effective, but there may be pockets of excellence. You may have a team that you look at and say, shoot, those guys are actually doing pretty well. Uh, they got it down. They had an ex uh, we had a, 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 a client who had a uh, dev manager who came from Visa. Well, he, he got, the, he got the, the religion at Visa airdropped into this client, so that whole team 
got it, just because of that presence of one person. So that's important to know. Because you can essentially spend limited time in other teams. You say, Bill's got it there, let me work on team A, B, and C, because Bill, I think Bill gets it. So why the Bills of the world are important, Bills and Jills and others, so we're not sexist, is I would say the most important thing, this is where I see if you don't do this part, you will fail, and that is secure champions. Uh, I think Brad Arkin and the guys at Adobe have done the most public uh, uh, version of that in the form of their Ninja program, but this is a conscious cultivation of relationships for essentially volunteers within the dev teams. And so we're, what we, uh, this is because, again, you got 12 or five or seven, they've got 3,000. You simply are not going to ever be invited to all those meetings. They're not gonna think about it, this stuff. When you're not in the room, somebody on that team has to say, wait a second. I mean, this is a net new function. I heard about threat modeling from Brooke at some conference. Let me, let me, let me get up and understand how we handle this data at rest over here. So how you do that, this is a conscious effort. The most sophisticated that I've seen spend money, spend a little bit of money, usually on pizzas and giveaways and bribery and stuff like that. But what they do is essentially do a lunch and learn or the equivalent of lunch and learns or some kind of rollout. Because what we found is within every one of those dev teams, there's one person that took one or two classes in their CS undergraduate that like get this topic. And here's a big point. Almost in every dev team, there is a desire for differentiation between the developers. Usually in a dev team, there's a person that wants to be known as the UX UI person. There's a person that's the, the web services person. There's always an opportunity within every dev team to deputize a security person and formalize that and give them a stakeholder role to do on your behalf what you can't do because you're never in the room. So that, that conscious effort to reach out, find those people, who they are, where they're at, programize that so you can essentially communicate that to them. They get rewarded for this in their business, uh, in their performance assessments. Hey, in addition to doing all their stuff, oh, they're the, they're the group security guru, SDLC security guru. Um, you know, the other thing with secure, uh, secure champions, you may, again, for the compliance driven organizations, you may invoke the, the uh, internal audit folks. I, I've, I've seen organizations where if internal audit says it, I believe it, that settles it. So <laughs> maybe your first trip is internal, internal audit, get them to do an audit opinion. You can walk around and say, hey, I'm not saying you need to do this. They're saying you need to do this. I'm just, I'm just communicating this to you. So uh, you know, it's consciously cultivating allies, uh, proxies, very important. Uh, there's different ways to do that, but this is really an, uh, not articulated in most of the literature that, we've, uh, that we cover. Uh, okay, so you've got this, you know, a framework, you've established uh, some context for what you're going to do. You have some allies that are out there. Uh, the next thing to do is define strategies and standards in, in, in a very lightweight way. When I say standards, that sounds, you know, are we going to use NIST versus ISO? Keep it real simple. Uh, real easy, real simple. Uh, and again, you're trying to do the, the, the most with the least, and you've got seven people or 12 or three or four or whatever. So, uh, apply the, the uh, most amount of resources on the scariest apps. That's, that's uh, one thing that I've seen in probably about half the organizations is they don't even have a full risk ranking or list of their applications. I, I would say at least in the upper mid market, that's the $30 billion to like $5 billion companies. Most of them don't have a comprehensive list. So if you're going to start hurtling down the highway, maybe getting that, rank, that risk rank list uh, done will help you uh, justify what you're doing. Uh, you know, a lot of times the assessments for the biggest and most critical apps will help further justify resource allocation. So throughout this process, I say iterative. I mean, what you're trying to do is show victories and then continued, uh, get continued, uh, you know, resources in, absent of some type of uh, application breach. Uh, then you start to define uh, uh, standards for future improvement. And I, I would say, I'm going to just point to one in the interest of time and reference that. I love the, the brevity uh, strategy of saying, look, we're just going to define 10 things that our organization holds to be true, holds to be self-evident, and you know, how we handle data, how we handle uh, mobile applications, we, how we handle web services, how we hand, you know, a handful of things. This is what we, we do. We, we check all of our mobile applications for security flaws before we publish them on an app store. We, uh, handle uh, logins a particular way. We don't let our development team roll their own. If you can do this and put this in terms of developers and have this on a three by five 
or a, worse yet, a five by seven card, you might have had more impact than any bit of you know, OWASP or AppSec orthodoxy that you know to be true. It becomes real when they start to do it and they start to parrot it back to you. Um, implement threat modeling on the most high level and most, uh, most critical applications. Uh, we've sat, sat through two or three sessions here. I mean, this is the high, we have, to have some of the high priests of, of threat modeling. If you can at least get the organization to say, well, maybe we need to call the AppSec organization to get them to do a threat model, consulting to the business, uh, that's a victory. But defining standards, and I'd keep them modest and show wins. And, and uh, again, no, recognizing that you've got all the types of development frameworks, languages, and such, try to apply uh, you know, the, the Pareto principle throughout. Okay, so executive, execute the initiative, uh, empower the and champions, call on them, leverage them, uh, you know, communications uh, via blogs and internal uh, medium is important. The irony of all this, I mean, I mean, how many people here, besides the obvious sales and marketing staff here, how many people consider themselves sales and marketing professionals? Okay, I, I got bad news. Like if you're the Stucky and you're one of the five or seven or 12 and you've got 3,000 people to convince to do something different that they're not getting their butts kicked, you, you are actually a sales and marketing professional. You just don't know it. And that's the challenge we have here is you got to do the Jedi mind trick and you got to get these people to do this stuff, again, on your behalf for something that their business unit is not kicking them in the teeth to do, right? Um, okay, so you got to communicate tailor this to the audience, start to capture metrics. There's been a lot of metric talk here. Pick one metric, whatever that is. You know, uh, bugs per line of code, you know, a deep software security defects per line of code, mean time to remediate, pick one, then do two. Don't pick 10, pick one initially. And again, uh, highlight positive behaviors. Because one thing I've learned in my limited time in this world is that software developers don't like to suck, right? and they don't like to suck compared to their peers. So you don't want to shame others. Some organizations that, you know, shaming works. But what I like is when you highlight the positive behaviors and you say, look at these guys, look at what this team did. And then suddenly the dev manager's like, wait a second, we don't want to be the team that sucks, so let's go and, and figure this stuff out. So uh, reinforcing positive behaviors around uh, uh, software development gets them to start to do this. Uh, ultimately, when we see success is when the onus of this activity lives in the development organizations and not in the security uh, organization. I simply don't think we are there yet by, by a long shot. So okay, exe execute the initiative and then sustain the program. Uh, monitor, iterate, uh, monitor the regulatory environment, the technology environment. Here's the other thing, I mean, PCI is an example. They have a new DSS that comes out. There's a new attack surface. There's new applications, mobile changes. Uh, you know, suddenly you found that sales organization moved their entire uh, CRM to the cloud without telling you. Okay, that's part of the attack surface, uh, potentially. So this is the other thing is you've, you've really, really got to, there's, you know, there's no endpoint here. This is one of iteration. But I think most organizations are still trying to get everything under, uh, uh, under coverage. So uh, I'm going to wrap up so we have time for questions and answers. But I just, uh, I just end on a couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, the, the key term is sustained, sustainment, and focus, and iteration. Uh, take the long view, to, uh, to use a Chinese term. Uh, this is something that's going to take multi-years and maybe multi-generation. Uh, I mean, Jeff Williams, myself, Jim Manico, uh, Jeremiah have been doing this for 10 years plus, and we see uh, improvement in certain organizations, and we see others that are still struggling. So we got a lot of work to do, and uh, this is one way that I think some of these concepts here can be adapted and put to work uh, to make you more successful. And with that, uh, we've got time for at least a couple questions, preferably in the form of true-false, for the record. Yes, sir. Do you remember a study from a long time ago regarding how many days of training a developer needed in order to be able to correct coding bugs? Do you have an update on that? Yeah, OK. So uh, <laughs> that's, wow, that's a great question. This is, for, this is for my marketing team who watches this later. Uh, I did a study two years in a row uh, for AppSec USA in 2013 and 14 about the effectiveness of training on a coder's ability to write secure code. 
Uh, we suspended that study for one reason, it took a huge amount of resources and time. Uh, but what we came out of, and I can talk to you later, is it does in fact have an improvement. It's about 25% bump. So if uh, the most developers, if 70 is passing, 70%, most developers are around 60% on the first uh, whack. So it does improve them. But what we found is most developers will go gravitate back to the way they, uh, they developed in the first place, absent of SDLC changes or other reinforcement, which makes sense. Uh, so, that it, so if you have an organization that does training and then does no SDLC changes or no reinforcement or other thing, they will gravitate back to way, the way they did it. The other thing to remember with training is the turnover in the dev world is about 25 to 30% a year, depending on the organization and sector. So whatever organization you trained in 2012 or 13 is not the same organization you have right now. So there has to be a way to do the intake, the, the, the new hires. There has to be a way to do it in, in a not heavyweight fashion. So I could grab me afterwards. It's a, it's a topic of passion, but one that I think the results are not. I'll just say the utter absence of training is bad, but if you think an AppSec program is just to train everybody, that's, that's obviously not it either. So somewhere in between. We had another question up front. Nope, nope, nope. All right. Uh, oh, in the back. Jason. Yes, sir. Let me uh, give you the mic. Oh, I have to give you the mic. Otherwise, audio can't hear. <coughs> Otherwise, audio can't hear. Thanks, John. Um, as someone who's been in the industry for a long time, uh, web applications are essentially communicated and, and accessed through the web. Um, there's going to be more web applications and, you know, if we're talking about all this IoT stuff, you know, it's going to connect to a lot of really critical devices in the future that's also going to use web applications. Taking into the inherent irony of the Internet, which is that you have to leave it as open as possible, but which can invite a lot of bad guys, I mean, what, what is kind of your long view forward for how we can better secure these web applications um, as they get used more and more? Okay, thanks for the easy question, for the record. Uh, I, I think there are gonna, there could continually be new technologies uh, that will make it harder for developers to make prob uh, make uh, uh, you know, vulnerabilities. The, the memory management in Java and .NET is a, a good example. Uh, there are promising technologies around RASP. Uh, some of the automation that's happening around vulnerability management I think is pretty cool. That it takes stuff less uh, out of their hands. But I think what's going to happen is you're going to have less and less, well, Jeremiah may differ, but uh, you'll, you'll see less of the coding flaws. You're going to see more of the architectural flaws where people don't even ask the question. And I, I got to see Sammy's presentation yesterday on the car, hacking cars and, and all that. I mean, the, the, the point that he was making, I, I absolutely agree. The people at these large companies are not at, even asking the question, right? They don't even have a security staff to talk to to report a bug. They don't have a bug bounty. So what I worry about with IoT as an example are the Maytags of the world, if, you know, are the, the, the Kenmores, the people that do dryers and blenders, you know, <laughs> the, you know they, they, they're, they're leaning forward to get this capability, but they don't even have a person to ask the question, wait a second, you know, uh, is that good? And so that's what worries me as we secure kind of the classic .NET Java dev world in a more repeatable fashion, the, the, you're right, the world changes and suddenly we're trying to have to convince a new set of people about the importance of this. So the good news is I think everybody in this room and by extension everybody in our field will have jobs forever and, every, uh, and, and you'll be in demand as, as the different recruiters are. So I, I would say, uh, you know, I, my one last parting thought, that was a great question, is I'm looking now uh, to focus some energy around uh, visibility and volunteer disclosures uh, to, to enhance uh, behaviors, if that makes sense. To, have to make it easier for the Maytags and Kenmores of the world to, to make, ask the question. Um, and I was going to talk about this a little bit. You know, say flossing, right? Flossing is the metaphor. You, you know, we all know we should floss, right? But we kind of don't. I, I'm, I'm reading a book right now that talks about that brushing, their te brushing teeth in the early 1900s was a new thing. If you go back to the 1880s and 1890s in this country, in most countries, brushing didn't happen on a recurring basis. So people's teeth fell out. So ch behaviors were changed. I'll use the passive phrase. It took 100 plus years. 
I'm not sure how quickly this is gonna change, but I, I do think we need to change behaviors, have more incentives. Uh, there are gonna be more spectacular breaches and we've got a lot of work to do. So with that uh, party note, I, I appreciate your time. I'll be around if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you.